Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a decision from the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. This is Sons of Confederate Veterans versus the University of Texas at Austin. In this case, Austin was moving several monuments related to Confederacy. And the Sons of the Confederate Veterans are suing on basis of First Amendment freedom of speech rights. So the court is going to analyze whether or not there is a First Amendment issue here, whether or not the Sons of Confederate Veterans have standing over this issue. And so let's get started with this. This consolidated case involves the First Amendment and state law challenges to the removal or relocation of Confederate monuments from a San Antonio park and on the University of Texas Austin campus. In the early 1900s, Major George Littlefield, a Civil War veteran, donated funds to the University of Texas to build a massive bronze arch over the southern end of the campus, a statue of President Woodrow Wilson, and statues of five Confederate leaders, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, Albert Sidney Johnson, and John H. Reagan. The university placed the statues on its campus in the 1930s, but it never built the arch. About a century later, the university president, Gregory Finez, had the statutes relocated. The plaintiffs sued to enjoin the university, first in state court and then in federal court in Austin, to reverse its district decision to relocate the statutes. And, you know, I, 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 I kind of disagree with Tom Scott's conclusion on the VPN thing. Um, I think that there is value in hiding my activity from my ISP. Um, you know, it does put a point of failure because like it puts the point of failure at the VPN, not the ISP, right? So if my VPN can track my information, then they can sell that information to third parties and also the government can subpoena it. If I give it to a VPN, then it depends whether how much I trust the VPN, right? So if they, maybe they won't sell to third parties and maybe it's not subpoenable. So I, I disagree with Tom Scott's conclusion on, on the use of VPNs. Personally, I find them use valuable. I use a VPN. I use private internet access right now, uh, which seems to be working for me very well. And I think it has value to shield my data and, you know, make it a little bit more difficult for, you know, the government to figure out exactly what I'm doing. And also like shields my end connection in case, you know, someone was trying to spy on me for some reason. So. I think it's valuable, so, yeah. And Kotaku, that's exactly why I picked PIA, picked, picked, picked private internet access. Yeah, that's because they have been subpoenaed, they have shown them in court and have testified they have no nothing to disclose. So like, yeah, I trust I trust p private internet access as a point of failure more than my, v than my internet provider as a point of failure. So I disagree with Tom Scott's conclusion. You know, he can bite me. <laughs> Plaintiff's federal complaint alleged First Amendment and Texas Monument Protection Act violations and claim that the Board of Regents breached the bequest agreement and exceeded its authority over the university. After the court dismissed plaintiff's First Amendment complaint, it declined to exercise supplemental jurisdiction over the remaining state law claims. The issue before us is whether plaintiffs have standing to bring their First Amendment claims. Plaintiffs argue they have standing under the case to bring the free speech claims, they argued in briefing that they have municipal taxpayer standing to bring the free speech claim, but they abandoned this ground on standing for oral argument. We therefore do not address the issue. And that makes pretty good sense because the idea of taxpayer standing in federal court normally is not going to fly. So whatever standing you thought it gave you is probably a good concession to give it up because it wasn't going to work anyway. To establish standing, plaintiffs must show they have suffered an injury in fact. A personal injury that's traceable to a defendant's alleged conduct and is likely to be redressed by a favorable decision. The injury must be both concrete and particularized. An injury is particularized if it affects the plaintiff in a personal and individual way. That is, the plaintiffs must have a direct stake in the outcome. Plaintiffs argue that because they have unique ties to the Confederate monuments and to the Confederacy, these monuments express plaintiff's political viewpoint and therefore that defendants remove or relocation of these monuments violate the plaintiff's First Amendment rights. That is, plaintiffs claim to have standing because moving these monuments injured their free speech rights. But even if plaintiff alleges a concrete free speech interest, if moving these monuments even implicates the First Amendment, they fail to show the violation of the interest is in fact an injury to your right. And herein, the court highlights the problem. When you're going to court to defend someone's rights, you can only defend yours. 
you have to be injured. So someone's First Amendment rights being injured does not give you standing. You have to show why it's a violation to your rights, why you're being hurt. Are these your statutes? Did you pay for them? You know, what is your connection to them? We really, really like them and we have ties to the meaning behind them is not going to fly. The United Daughters of the Confederacy, Major Littlefield, and Congress donated these monuments or the funds to build them. Plaintiffs argue on appeal that these donors or the beneficiaries, these donations collaborate with the university or the city when erecting or placing them, and therefore co-authored the political speech the monuments express. But plaintiffs never argue they donated the monuments or the funds for building them or explain how they co-authored the monument's speech. Plaintiffs state several reasons why they are particularly invested in the monuments. They feel strongly about the message these monuments supposedly convey about the Confederacy and the Civil War. They claim to be descendants of Confederate veterans, including one of the donors. They claim the monuments were public charitable gifts and the plaintiffs are among the intended beneficiaries. For example, they argue that the cannons were donated for the benefit of the United Confederate Veterans and that the Sons of Confederate Veterans, as a successor association to that group, is now the gift's intended beneficiary. Plaintiffs therefore care deeply about preserving monuments that convey a viewpoint that they support and they believe in and that their ancestors donated for their benefit. Plaintiffs would, of course, prefer a world where the university and the city displays plaintiffs' favored monuments. Plaintiffs provide reasons, presumably strong ones, for why they are more attached to the monument's viewpoint than their general public is. But strong reasons are no better than weak ones at giving plaintiffs a direct and personal stake in the litigation. Yes, the court is quite right here. We really, really like the monuments. We really, really like the message they spend. These monuments are really, really important to us. Is not a free speech interest of yours. They're not your monuments. You may really like them, but it's not impacting your speech. It's impacting someone else's speech, maybe, but not you. So, you know, you can have all the speech you want, but you can't defend someone else's rights. Makes total sense to me. The fundamental and fatal flaw with plaintiff's argument is that they conflate agreeing with speech with authoring speech. They claim that this is their speech that has been abridged, yet conspicuously absent from their allegations is anything that shows this to be true. Plaintiffs merely agree with the ideas that they feel these monuments express and sued in hopes of keeping them on display. They are undoubtedly passionate about these ideas and are upset that symbols of their values, like these monuments, have been removed from the public square. But what plaintiffs seek is only to vindicate their own value preferences, not to redress a First Amendment injury particular to them. Their passion, however sincere, does not place them among the injured. Thus, plaintiffs have not alleged a particularized injury. So that is the end of the case of Sons of Confederate Veterans versus the University of Texas at Austin. In this case, we learned that people donated certain statutes to memorialize and honor Confederate soldiers and notable personalities, and that these statutes were, in, these statues were um, installed at the University of Austin. And 100 years later, the university wanted them removed because they no longer reflected the university's perspective. The Sons of Confederate Veterans sued, arguing, largely in part, we really, really like the monuments, and we'd prefer that they stay up. The Court of Appeals is concluding, and I think quite correctly, that they do not have standing because they're not their statutes, they didn't pay for them, they didn't, they didn't maintain them, and them really, really liking them does not give them standing. You know, this is not their speech that's being impended. You know, if the people who donated to them want to bring a case, then maybe we'll talk. But otherwise, you know, you can't just bring standing a case because you really, really like it. It's not your speech. So go away. And that is the end of this case. Thank you for joining me as we both read this case together and now better understand the law. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please subscribe to this channel. It really helps us grow. And check out one of our other videos, including the one that's currently being displayed on the thumbnail on screen. Thank you so much for your continued support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.